at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. It wasn't a record anyone was necessarily looking to break, but we did it anyway. San Antonio dealing with its hottest day since 2013, hitting 107 degrees, and that is without factoring in the heat index. Meteorologist Sarah Spivey with the details and when we can expect some kind of any kind of cool down in just a few minutes. And that record breaking heat, a big factor in San Antonio firefighters efforts to fight a huge apartment fire on the far north side this afternoon. Sky 12 showing just what fire crews were up against and the 11,800 block of Parliament. They responded to the Parliament Bend apartments a little after 2.30. When it was all said and done, more than 100 firefighters had been dispatched to help fight the flames and also the heat. Jaffney Gray is live right now. Jaffney, the heat, a bit of an obstacle. Is that why they use so many firefighters? Well, for sure. Like you said, Fire Chief Charles Hood says that they've had over 36 units out here and easily over 100 firefighters working this fire. Now, if you take a look behind me, you'll notice that it's under control. They got the fire out and they're managing hot spots. But a part of the reason why so many are responding to make sure firefighters are not overwhelmed by the heat is because they're just trying to make sure they're calling in more reinforcements when needed. Now, fire broke out in the 24 unit building where Hood says flames started on the first floor, worked its way up until it reached the attic. He said crews fought the fire offensively for about 30 minutes before going on the defensive approach. No injuries were reported and everyone has been uh, accounted for on scene as a rehab bus and via buses for firefighters and people to cool off since they had to shut the power off to the complex. Now, when I asked just how hot the temperature can get when battling fire in extreme heat such as this, Chief Hood simply said hot is hot. You have to be mentally prepared to fight fire on a day like today, whether it's a dry heat like I experienced in Phoenix or a moist, humid heat like you have here, it is hot. So you have to hydrate before you come to work. You have to have eaten. You have to be physically fit. And so these are all things that we are making sure our folks are doing right now. The Chief Hood said that they've also been able to save several animals but are looking for more. He says they plan to be out here for a while and will have someone come out to assist the number of people having to be displaced. But Chief Hood also mentioned that on top of trying to make sure that firefighters are not being overwhelmed by the heat, he says we're still dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, even mentioning that some firefighters who were infected months ago have since recovered but are out here today working this fire. So they're monitoring that closely as well. Again, the fire is still under investigation. Investigation. Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thinking about those fire crews and those people in those apartments. Thanks, Jaffany. Another fire crews were called to deal with in a very hot day today. This one on the far west side. Fire crews called to a home on Rosy Cloud near Poppy Sands. That was around 930 this morning. They say they saw heavy smoke and flames coming from the back side of the home when they reached the scene. Firefighters were able to get that fire out, but the home did have some smoke and water damage. No one was hurt here. The cause of the fire is now under investigation. The excessive heat that those firefighters were battling out there can also be dangerous for seniors if they can't afford air conditioning. That's why the city of San Antonio is keeping nine branch libraries open until 7 p.m. as cooling centers through Friday. To make sure they'll be able to cool off safely, visitors will be asked a few screening questions and have their temperatures checked. The areas where they can sit are also being cleaned and disinfected after they leave. We want to be sure that they have something that they can come to and something that they can count on during this pandemic. We have the locations of those cooling centers, including community centers around the city, right now on our website at ksat.com. Could the key to defeating and preventing COVID-19 lie within our own cells? That's what a San Antonio doctor aims to prove with several studies just recently approved by the FDA. Courtney Friedman explains how the stem cells work and why they're expected to make a difference when it comes to the coronavirus. It's a common question. How in the world can stem cells be used to treat issues from hair loss to rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and now possibly COVID-19? Mesenchymal stem cells have a unique ability to transform into multiple different tissues. So they turn off inflammation 
and they turn on immune regulation. San Antonio doctor Derek Guillory is the principal investigator for three different trials studying stem cells and COVID-19. He's working with Houston-based stem cell research company, Celtex. Two of the studies already approved by the FDA will use a patient's own stem cells, harvested from fat cells in their stomach or hip, grown and multiplied in a lab, and then re-injected into their body. It's your own tissue. So there's no chance of rejection. One study will test if those stem cells can prevent COVID-19. The second will determine if they can treat patients who already have the virus. Stem cells have already successfully treated similar viruses that affect the lungs. There are a few trials, mostly from Asia, that prove a very big benefit. Dr. Guillory will soon begin choosing patients for the trials. The catch is it takes weeks for harvested stem cells to multiply enough to become effective. So he has to choose patients who have already banked their cells. That can cost thousands of dollars, but he hopes if the trials succeed, the cost will drop dramatically. Dr. Gilroy's third study is pending FDA approval and will inject COVID-19 patients with another person's stem cells. So if somebody is is diagnosed with a COVID-19 and they meet the tr criteria for the study, we could enroll them, we could give the treatment starting the next day. Either way, he's confident these studies will be successful in proving the key to beating COVID-19 may already be inside of us. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Now, if you're interested in banking your cells or being part of these clinical trials, we have information on how to contact Celtex on our website. Just head to ksat.com. After being delayed by the coronavirus pandemic, some unfinished business will, at the ballot box will be decided tomorrow. The March primary runoffs have already had a large turnout for early voting, and election officials say they are ready for a busy day tomorrow. Sarah Costa has a look at one race we're watching, the race for the Democratic nomination for U.S. Senate. Democratic candidates MJ Hagar, who is a U.S. Air Force veteran, and Royce West, who is a longtime Texas lawmaker, are going head to head, and the winner will face U.S. Senator John Cornyn in the fall. We got a chance to talk to them about a number of issues, one of them, their thoughts on the removal of statues from public display. I am glad to see people moving to take down these statues because we need to acknowledge our history and learn from it to try to keep it from repeating as much as possible, even though I think that happens a lot. Um, but we need to choose what we honor and what we glorify and what we celebrate. I think we take them, we put them in a museum and those persons that want to be able to study those particular statutes and uh, uh, what they mean, then they should be able to do them there. But they should not, in my estimation, be a, um, in, in public view at the Capitol or anyone at any place else. If you head to KSAT.com right now, you can see more about what each candidate stands for on a number of issues. Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic right now. Let's go to the Trans Guide camera at 35 at Evans Road. And you can see, I'm guessing that's the northbound traffic coming towards us. Uh, very slow going at this hour. No major traffic accidents to tell you about, but uh, this is slow going at I-35 and Evans for sure. Sand, surf, and social distancing. That's what's in store if you venture out to the beach this summer, and many beaches are open, but there are restrictions. Rules can vary from one city to another, so you're going to want to plan ahead. For instance, at South Padre City Beaches, only one pole umbrella is allowed for shade. No more than two chairs under them. And beach setups need to be 15 feet apart no matter what beach you may visit. You also want to bring a mask. If you're safely set up away from people, you may be able to take it off, but you're still going to need one with you. If you decide to go for a walk or anywhere where you might come into close proximity with other people, always make sure to put your mask back on. When you swim, however, the CDC says it's safer to remove the mask, but be sure to remain socially distanced. If you want to check conditions and crowds, we have links to several live beach cams on our website, ksat.com. Look outside with live cam today. Hope you've had a view from the inside looking out today. 106 oh. right now. 
Sarah, days like today, we say, okay, is there any relief from this heat in sight? And, and Myra, relief in this form looks like temperatures finally getting out of the triple digits, and they will do so later this week, but you're right, 107 for the high temperature in San Antonio. Unfortunately, the aquifer continues to fall and is down more than half a foot over the past 24 hours. Some good news in our forecast. Pollen count mold is low, but this was a look at those high temperatures today. 107 in San Antonio, 112 in Del, Del Rio, ties for the all-time high temperature in Del Rio. 111 in Catula, 105 in Gonzales, 104 in LaGrange, and 105 in Kerrville. Just hot wherever you look. Right now, it's 106 degrees outside, so it is still very unreasonably hot. The humidity, however, is only at 18%, and that is going to be our saving grace this evening. The humidity being low is going to allow temperatures to tumble, and it'll actually be pleasant in the evening hours tonight. So if you want to get some time out on the porch with your family, you can do that. Just wait until the sun sets. Unfortunately, we're going to have another hot day tomorrow. Forecast high of 103, so it is going to be a CPS Energy uh, peak energy demand day, which basically means that between the hours of 3 p.m. and 7 p.m., we're going to try to reduce your energy because the power grid is going to be stressed. Here are some tips on how to save energy during these very hot days. Minimize your appliance use, turn off lights in an empty room, and close windows and blinds and shades to make sure that you're able to save some energy there. So again, that's between the hours of 3 and 7 p.m. I'll be back with more in-depth details on today's highs in a few minutes. Steve, Myra. It is time now for the daily briefing on local COVID-19 numbers in the city and county. Let's listen in. District, as well as Dr. Ken Davis, who is the chief medical officer for Chris's Santa Rosa Health Center. And this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. We do hope you had a safe and physically distanced weekend. Tonight, we continue with the trend of cases that we've been reporting and are reporting 565 new cases of COVID-19, which brings a total number of cases to 20,000. 213. We do unfortunately have 11 new deaths to report. Six of them are Hispanic and five were right, white. Uh, seven were male, four were female. Their ages ranged from 40 to 80. And the fi five of the deaths occurred uh, at home while the remainder were being treated in local hospitals. We've now suffered the loss of 195 San Antonians during the COVID-19 pandemic thus far. And our deepest sympathies are with their families. Our hospital system now is under severe stress. 1,267 people are hospitalized with 421 in the ICU and 257 on ventilators. We now have 45% of ventilators available and 10% of hospital beds available. As you know, there are seven progress and warning indicators that we've been telling you about weekly to talk about the uh, where we are in the course of this pandemic. And we've been going through each of them on Mondays, but to simplify it for you, we've taken, uh, we've created a new risk level graphic that will be an indicator of how our community is doing and what stage of of the uh, pandemic we are in. We've combined the seven indicators into one collective risk level, and we are currently between severe and critical. We are nowhere near the sustained decline in new COVID cases. We continue to have more than 1,000 people in local hospitals, and the positivity rate of COVID tests has increased slightly now to nearly 25%. The hospital system as a whole, as we said, is under severe stress. So what does that mean for you? The messages have not changed, and if it helps to remember them, they fall under three Ps, prevent the spread, protect your family, and provide information. You can pre prevent the spread by wearing a mask, washing your hands, and maintaining social distance. You can protect your family by staying home, avoiding crowds, and creating closed social, social bubbles. Again, your household unit. And finally, you can pro provide information which critically helps us in the fight, of this the fight of this virus. If you test positive, answer the call from the contact tracers and let your close contacts know if they should self-quarantine. Um, and again, these are ongoing guidance from our medical community and critically important for us to protect uh, the San Antonio health and welfare. So I'll turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, we're going to be in for well, a good while of tough issues, uh, particularly over the next two weeks, if we don't get a handle on this thing. And it's not just us. 
It's every major metropolitan area in the state that's just running about the same thing we are. Even across the nation, you're seeing this uh, continuing to be a big, big problem in the growing number of cases. But the next two weeks are going to, I think, are going to be pretty critical to us. And they're uh, a major thing that's about to come about and we have some concern about is that uh, on August the 10th, um, I know that San Antonio Independent School District is going to be going back into operation. I believe it's August the 27th on uh, Northside District. And then you have another 15 school districts uh, in our area that may have different starting times. Now, this is going to be a problem. Uh, let's just take Clark High School. Uh, there was some 3,000 students there. A parent has the ability to say, okay, I want my child to go, or I'll take the uh, uh, lessons over the internet. Uh, let's just say uh, 2,500 of them show up at Clark High School, and you got teachers that are going to be in a vulnerable pos uh, position. That is an incredible thing to try to handle, like trying to herd a lot of wild cats. And uh, most of these students aren't going to have much of a fear. So we hope that the Texas Education Agency will uh, give these school districts some ability to stage and to say how many people ought to be there. If you read any of the governor's uh, latest initiatives, um, uh, no more than 100 people in one place, uh, even going down to 10, and then we say, um, you know, 2,500 or 3,000 kids could end up in one school. Uh, hopefully he's going to take a look at this and decide that school districts ought to have some flexibility in determining uh, how many kids will come in at any given time to sort of stagger their classes. And uh, we're hoping that he will do that. Uh, we think school districts have the right to maybe delay their opening for three weeks, but this is almost on us now. So uh, uh, we're hoping to get some support on that, and, and we hope that uh, the governor and the Texas Education Agency is going to be uh, paying attention to this, because this could be another big problem already laying on top of a huge problem we've got now with uh, so many social gatherings, so many places where tons of people are coming together, which is by far the most dangerous thing we can be doing. So hopefully, Mayor, will get some support on that. Wholeheartedly agree, Judge, and, and that is an, an incredibly important part of us working together to slow the spread of this virus and, and how we get back to school is, is obviously on the minds of parents and, and our entire community. So we'll be meeting with superintendents this week and, and talking more about their plans. I also want to make note that in partnership with the nonprofit organization Lift Fund, the city of San Antonio is now utilizing federal funding provided by the CARES Act to provide grants to small businesses and nonprofit organizations that have been impacted financially by COVID-19. The grant program is an initiative of the COVID-19 Community Recovery and Resiliency Plan, and that was approved again by San Antonio City Council last month and corresponds with the Commissioner's Court program as well. The application period is open today, July 13th, 2020, and closes on Monday, July 27th, with $24.7 million made available. Lift Fund will administer the grants, and all completed applications will be reviewed Reviewed for basic eligibility. Eligible businesses can apply by going to the website covid19.sanantonio.gov slash recovery grants, or you can call 1-800-494-497. Not a lot of optimism in the latest update from Mayor Ron Nuremberg and County Judge Nelson Wolf. Uh, the county judge saying the next two weeks will be critical for us. They outlined a new chart, uh, kind of a color grid. Uh, critical being the top of the scale right now. We are between severe and critical for seven indicators that show the progress that we're making or not making when it comes to fighting this disease. And again, we're just down to 10% of staffed hospital beds available, 11 new deaths in the last 24 hours. And I think a big part of the message today was that as coronavirus cases increase, we are getting continually closer to heading back to school. So you heard Judge Nelson Wolf there urging the TEA, the Texas Education Agency, and the governor to take another look at what schools may be allowed to do. They were encouraging uh, the TEA to uh, give schools the leeway to limit how many people should be on campus. Yeah. Of course, we know that parents have the option to send kids back to class in person, but also do education on 
online. So we will see how all of that plays out as parents and teachers are trying to grapple with what this next school year will look like. Asking for some flexibility and there has been talk out there that maybe they could delay the start of school till after Labor Day. All right, let's take a look at the weather out there. Sarah Spivey standing by with these temperatures, Sarah. Yeah, these temperatures have been impressive. The high temperature today uh, in San Antonio was 107, and I want to show you guys just how impressive these high temperatures have been. Out toward Del Rio, we were at 112 degrees. Now, by the way, 112 degrees is the hottest temperature ever recorded in Del Rio. This day has tied many days for that record, but still very impressive. In San Antonio, 100 and seven the high temperature that is the hottest temperature ever recorded in San Antonio for the month of July since records have been taken in 1885 that's 135 years so this heat is real deal 107 for the high in Hondo 108 in Uvalde 108 in New Braunfels and 105 in Gonzales all because of this heat dome and this heat high which is a big bully for us and unfortunately it's going to stay strong now we are going to see temperatures trend down a little bit but still Still tomorrow, a high temperature of 103. That is no joke. In fact, there's another heat advisory in place from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. That's the peak heating hours of the day. We'll have a breeze from the south at 5 to 15 miles per hour. And then from there, we are going to see temperatures trend down. By Friday, we'll be at 97 degrees. 97 has never looked so good. The one thing I would caution you against, though, is the humidity is going to rise. Dew points are going to rise. So that 97 going to feel like 100 anyway and at least though we won't have to be dealing with 107 degrees we've got a small chance for rain on friday but that's about it in this dry forecast all right thanks sarah we'll be right back As we're meeting with student athletes and sharing their concerns about social justice, UT officials have announced several major changes going forward. First, the field at Darrell K. Royal Memorial Stadium will be named after the school's two Heisman Trophy winners, Earl Campbell and Ricky Williams. This comes at the request of the Joe Jamail family that previously bore his name. At the same time, a statue will be erected to Julius Whittier, who's the Longhorn's first black football letterman and a graduate of Highlands High School here in San Antonio in 1969. University of Texas interim president Jay Hartzell also says the eyes of Texas will continue to be the school's alma mater saying aspects of its origin, whether previously widely known or unknown, have created a rift in how the song is understood and celebrated, and that must be fixed. But players who do not want to stand on the field while the song is being played will be allowed to go to the locker room. Here's what he said to continue in his statement. Together, we have the power to define what the eyes of Texas expect of us, what they demand of us, and what standard they hold us to now. The eyes of Texas should not only unite us, but hold us accountable to our institution core values. But we first must own the history. Only then can we reimagine this future. And I look forward to partnering with our campus community to do just that. Now, one of the student athletes demanding changes on the campus is former Steel High School star Caden Stearns, the junior defensive back, was just named to the Chuck Vignarek Award preseason watch list. is announced by the Maxwell Football Club today. The award is given out each year to the most outstanding defensive player in college football. Stern has played in 22 games or 21 starts. Last season appeared in nine games, missing four due to injury, but he still managed 58 tackles, 23 solo, four tackles for a loss, one sack, and broke up a pass. He was a Big 12 Defensive Freshman of the Year. He's joined on that watch list by his teammate Jack Joseph Osai. The UTSA Roadrunners have made it official. Former Judson High School star Julon Williams has signed his financial agreement with the university and after two years at Houston is joining the Roadrunners. Williams, who's now a wide receiver, must sit out the 2020 season per NCAA transfer rules, but will still have two years of eligibility left starting in 2021. He's also the younger brother of Jarvin Williams, who's UTSA career rushing leader who played between 2013 and 2016, is currently a graduate assistant with the program. Julon was a stand, standout dual threat quarterback back at Judson between 2014 and 2017, throwing for over 6,700 yards, 60 touchdowns, rushing for another 3,369 yards, another 58 touchdowns with a record of 42 and 12 as a starter. Today is the day the University Interscholastic League is allowing summer strength and conditioning camps to continue. One of the first to hit the field today, the Alamo Heights Mules. Remember, this is just not for football players. This is for all student athletes who have been sidelined for the last four months since the UIL shut down all sports during the state high school basketball championships here in San Antonio in March. And again, when school districts started pulling the plug two weeks ago when the COVID-19 numbers spiked, now they're back at the field under new head coach and athletic director Ron Riddeman. Any chance we get to come out here 
Uh, and we're following the guidelines. Uh, we're keeping them away from each other. They're wearing masks when they're not actually doing the exercises. Uh, and I think the guidelines have proven to be effective. And so we were excited to get back out here bright and early this morning uh, and just see how this goes going forward. All right, the high school football season is slated to start with the first games on August the 27th. First game for the Alamo Heights Mules, who are having to use Comalander Stadium as their home stadium this season due to the construction of the Heights campus, will kick off on August the 28th at Bernie. Big question is, will that happen on August the 27th? For that matter, will school start on time? Yeah. Everything's up in the air right Still now. some questions. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. This pandemic has been unprecedented. It has changed social norms. It has changed our lives in ways that we really couldn't imagine. And for a lot of us, that has people looking for relief, for any distraction. And unfortunately for some, people have turned to substance abuse as a way to seek that. We're joined now for today's case at Q&A by Avita Marine, the CEO of Rise Recovery, a nonprofit that helps with substance abuse and addiction recovery. Avita, thanks for being with us today. Can you just talk about what your organization has been seeing throughout this pandemic? Absolutely. Um, so since COVID happened, there has been such an increase in isolation that people in recovery who need community as a component of their healing are, are finding themselves risking relapse. Uh, some of them are relapsing. There's a surge in overdoses nationally that is deeply impacting the treatment facilities and recovery resources in our community. What does it mean for you? What have you seen at RISE? Well, uh, since we focus on youth, young adults, and their families, we are seeing uh, we're seeing an increase in, in uh, family members reaching out to say, you know, we don't have the resources that we used to. Uh, we don't have the same oversight with the support system, the schools, and the after after school kind of programs to support them. Um, and and as a result of that, we're seeing some some behavior that you know, if caught in school, what might have resulted in a detention or in a suspension, but now because there's no oversight, now it's hitting the criminal justice system. And these kids that may have been gotten a slap on the hand are now receiving much more serious consequences. You talked a little bit about before we started this segment, how you have seen it be much more prevalent on social media, people drinking mm -hmm. together, especially like you said, now we're all in our homes for the most part. Are people coming to you for the first time? In some instances, these issues may not be something that they have dealt with before, but now they're reaching out to rise for help. Absolutely. I think, you know, the advantage to the way that we've pivoted and moved to online uh, social support groups is that people can come to us without having to go to uh, a space that they may feel uh, is, at, is putting them at health risk. So we have been getting some new intakes. We've been uh, really receive, uh, serving about the same amount of folks that we were before COVID, which was uh, concerning and also we're grateful to be to be doing that but I, I was surprised to see a continuation of need when I expected there to be a drop off when we switched from community space to online. This is such a prevalent problem when you're talking about substance abuse. There's a chance that somebody is out there watching right now and what you're saying and what you're talking about sounds familiar in their household. How can someone get help? What's the first thing people should do? Well, if you are a loved one, then the first thing I would recommend is getting help for yourself. There is only so much that we can do as loved ones for people who are on a journey of addiction. Uh, they really do have to help themselves. And sometimes, though we want to prevent that, if we can uh, reach reach a bottom. But for the, the loved ones, getting the care and support, the support group, being around other, other people like them who are also loved ones in recovery is really critical to learn how to create boundaries, take care of yourself, take care of your families. And if you are yourself struggling, knowing that this is, you are not alone, even though we are increasing isolation, there are spaces you can come that will welcome you for uh, a journey of recovery. So uh, 210 Say Care is a 24 hour hotline that's a partnership of Alpha Home, Lifetime and Rise Recovery. And all of us are on the phones and as well as Pay It Forward Ministries, we're all on the phone ready to answer a call 24 hours uh, a day. Uh, seven days a week in case someone just needs a connection to a resource and is ready to take that next step. We have shown some video here of a groundbreaking uh, about a new campus for you guys. What, what's that facility going to allow you to do and what services could people seek there? Right, so our facility, uh, we finally broke some ceremonial ground today. We were so excited about that. It has been 45 years in the making. We have been a 
a resource that's been supported by our local churches um, and lovingly so. But the problem with not having our own space is that this issue continues to remain in the shadows. And by having two beautiful acres of 22,000 square feet of, of this community resource available, we can now become that beacon of light and show people that we do exist, that we are not hidden in the halls of, of other places and that um, recovery is available for them. This community space will provide uh, a community center, uh, social activities for youth and adults and their families, we're, uh, our vision is to build a recovery school within our youth center, and we are we are already partnering for a pilot recovery in school program with Anne Frank uh, Charter, Anne Frank Academy uh, Inspire Academy Charter School this this coming fall to test that out. And uh, this new space will be really a safe haven for families who need recovery and who want to feel that love instead of shame and secrecy that they've often been struggling with. I want to say I want to reiterate again. We've got the number on the screen right now. 210 say care. That if you have any questions, that's the first step maybe in the process of recovery, correct? Yeah, I would recommend it. There are other hotlines and resources available. Uh, certainly, you know, nationally SAMHSA, but 210 say care will guarantee that you have someone who's experienced recovery themselves answering a phone that you will have a human being answering a phone or quickly returning a phone call and that you'll have access to local resources that are specific to Bear County. Again, Rise Recovery, a nonprofit organization that's there to help families and young people with addiction. Avita Marine, thank you for your time. We'll see you tonight on the Night Beat. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. News around America now, six days after she disappeared at a California lake, the body of former Glee actress Naya Rivera has been recovered. The body was discovered at Lake Piru this morning, according to the Ventura County Sheriff's Office. Authorities have been searching for the 33-year-old Rivera since Wednesday. She had gone to the lake to rent a pontoon boat with her four-year-old son. The boy was later found on the boat alone wearing a life jacket. Another life jacket was found on that boat as well. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham siding with Democrats who want Robert Mueller to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Graham, who is the committee chair, tweeted about Mueller's recent op-ed in The Washington Post and says he will grant Democrats request for Mueller to testify. The former special counsel defended his office's prosecution of Roger Stone in the op-ed, whose sentence was commuted by President Donald Trump the day before. Mueller was appointed in May of 2017 to investigate Russian interference in the 2016 election. So far, Mueller and his team have not talked about the details of their investigation, but Stone's commutation may be changing that. Let's look outside this evening with live cam 106, and that number is just not budging right now, Sarah. No, 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 no. However, there are some indications that the temperature is starting to drop a little bit as the sun gets a little lower, which is good news. But this is a look at the high temperatures today. We had 107 in, Del in uh, San Antonio, 112 in Del Rio. That's the hottest temperature that Del Rio's ever recorded. It ties the record in Del Rio. It's not all bad news though, there is a space station flyover tonight. It's gonna to be clear skies, and so if you want to, look out there at 9.44 p.m. It'll last six minutes, appearing in the south-southwest portion of the sky, disappearing in the east-northeast. It'll be pretty nice in the evening once those temperatures fall into the 80s by midnight. More on today's highs coming up. There hasn't been a new Ford Bronco in almost 25 years, but that is all changing. Ford will unveil its new line of Broncos tonight, but the company did tweet some photo teasers before the big reveal. There are three versions, a two door midsize version of the off road SUV, a four door version and a smaller off roader called the Bronco Sport. The automaker is effectively creating a separate sub brand for off road SUVs under the Bronco name. No word yet on prices, though there have been some speculation out there. Okay. Well, whatever it is you're driving, let's hope the AC <laughs> is working. Yeah. Because it's pumping. Because I think I, right now. I think that the roofs come off the Broncos, but you probably oh. wouldn't want that right oh, now. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 not at all. And in fact, all across the KSAT 12 viewing area, we've had a lot of pictures send in, uh, people send in pictures of just how hot it is out there. This one is from Seguin, uh, Teresa's backyard there. She's actually done a really good thing here, hanging the thermometer in the shade. That's actually where you should put your 
thermometer for the best temperature. It says 109 in Seguin, but this is also impressive. In Holotus, somebody has one of those thermometers, those laser pointer thermometers, measuring the temperature on the deck there, 180 degrees. Yeah, that's hot. This is why we say don't uh, walk your dogs during the peak heating hours of the day on asphalt or the sidewalk because that'll burn their paws. So if you do want to walk your dog over the next couple days, do it in the morning or in the evening well after the sun sets. This is what we were seeing today. This is the high temperatures. Keep in mind, San Antonio's average for this time of year is 94. We are well above that by about 10 to 15 degrees. This heat wave is the real deal. I want to focus for a moment here on on Del Rio. Del Rio's high temperature of 112 degrees ties for the hottest high temperature ever recorded in Del Rio. This day ties for the hottest temperature ever in Del Rio. Records have been taken there since 1905. Here in San Antonio, we hit 107 degrees. That is the hottest we've been in San Antonio since 2013, when we briefly got up to 108 in June. And 107 is the hottest July temperature ever recorded in San Antonio. And records for us in San Antonio go all the way back to 1885. That's 135 years. This heat is the real deal. Elsewhere, we had 107 in Pleasanton, 111 in Cato 108 in New Braunfels, 105 in Kerrville, and 107 in Hondo. Yes, we will be cooler than this tomorrow, but not by too much. Now, one of the reasons why we were able to see those temperatures soar is because our dew points went down. Humidity actually went down, so it's a dry heat out there right now, but that doesn't help us where temperatures are concerned. They still go up when it's dry outside. However, as we head into these evening hours, the drier air is actually going to make things pleasant for us. So if you want to get some time outdoors tonight, it'll actually feel OK. Still pretty hot around 8 when we'll still be in the triple digits. But low humidity and a breeze from the southeast about 10 to 20 miles per hour is going to make for a pretty pleasant evening. Temperatures will fall into the 80s by midnight. So you can do that. You can have some time out on the porch or out in the patio. Now the reason why we are so hot is because we're under the influence of this heat high, this heat dome. It is literally a dome of high pressure that acts a lot like a magnifying glass and in intensifying the summer's heat. And this heat dome is going to maintain its strength over San Antonio and the state of Texas for the next couple of days. In fact, this is a look at the high temperatures tomorrow all across the state of Texas. We are suffering from this heat. 111 for the high in Lubbock, 112 in Midland, 110 in Del Rio, 103 in Austin and here in San Antonio for the high tomorrow and 105 out in El Paso. So just to break down the numbers for you tomorrow, we'll wake up with a few clouds. It'll be right around 7. You can get out in the morning. That's a great time to get outside. It's the between the hours of 1 p.m. and 8 p.m. that will have another heat advisory. We're expected to get up to about 103 right at around dinner time. That's when it's dangerous to be outside. The city does have cooling centers that you can go to if you or your loved ones are without air conditioning. And then once again in the evening, it should be okay. After that, temperatures are going to gradually fall into the upper 90s by Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. However, the heat index is going to be high on those days. Humidity will be back, so it'll still feel like 100 on those days. And we have a small shot for an isolated shower or storm on Friday. So if you're a wishing person, if you're a praying person, pray for those isolated showers and storms on Friday. Cross those fingers. Yeah, cross yeah. those fingers. Thanks, Sarah. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's in case you missed it. And a good morning to you. It is Monday. It is July 13th. In case you haven't seen it yet, that is a Navy ship on fire. Looks like wartime, but the ship is actually docked in San Diego. However, firefighters definitely have a battle on their hands. The ship is still smoldering 24 hours after it caught on fire. There was an explosion on board the Bahami Richard below deck. It was in the storage area. At least 21 were injured, including 18 sailors. There were 160 sailors on board at the time. Several teams of firefighters are having to rotate onto the ship to fight the blaze. If you haven't filed your federal taxes yet, you need to do that by Wednesday. It was postponed due to the pandemic. And the IRS says it's best if you do that online. That's because there is a backlog of paper returns because employees have been working from home. 
Officers responded to the 1100 block of West Russell Place around 530 this morning. Police say someone driving by opened fire on the home. The girl was not seriously hurt and was not taken to the hospital. Right now, investigators are still looking for possible suspects. The former special counsel defended his office's prosecution of Roger Stone, whose sentence was commuted by President Donald Trump the day before. Mueller was appointed in May of 2017 to investigate Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. The record for the most money paid for a video game has been broken. Heritage Auction says it sold a copy of Super Mario Brothers for $114,000. The game was still sealed in its packaging and it had a hang tab underneath the plastic and that indicates it was one of the first variants of the 1985 game released. The sale was part of Auction House's comics and comic art sale. Well, hey, would you look at that? We cooled down to 105 from 107, but we will continue cooling down tonight. In fact, the temperatures will fall into the 80s by midnight, and it'll actually feel nice once the sun sets with the low humidity. But all in all, today was a very hot day, and tomorrow will be hot again. We'll climb up to 103 in the afternoon. Heat advisory between the hours of 1 p.m. and 8 p.m., so try to avoid being outdoors for long periods of time tomorrow afternoon. We'll cool down into the upper 90s. 90s for the highs, but still hot and isolated rain Friday possible. All right, be careful out there. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for watching the news at six. See you back here on the night beat at 10.